A cartographic myth is a geographic feature that appears on a map, but not on the earth. Kingdoms and cities where none ever were, or lakes and rivers where there is but dry land. One of the characteristics of cartographic myths is that they appear in areas beyond the known world, in places which were hard to get to or had not yet been visited. The poles, both the Arctic and the Antarctic, fell into this category until recent times. So it is not surprising that there are cartographic myths associated with both the North and South Poles. First, we'll look at a relatively short-lived but fascinating myth about the Arctic. In 1569, the great Flemish cartographer Gerard Mercator issued this important world map, the first to use the so-called Mercator projection. And on that map, he introduced a radical and strange notion of the geography around the North Pole. Along the very top of the map, the width of which is exaggerated because of the projection used, are four bodies of land with rivers running between them. This geography is clarified by an inset in the lower left, in which you can see four islands surrounding the North Pole, upon which lies a large rock. On this Mercator map of the region, issued a number of years later, we can see his North Pole mapped a bit more clearly. A legend on the 1569 map states that Mercator got his geography of the Arctic from a report of a friar and mathematician from Oxford, who supposedly in about 1360 and using, quote, magic arts, went to these polar islands and mapped them. Mercator's source of this story was a since lost 14th century account called the Inventio Fortunati. Describing the geography of the polar region, Mercator wrote to John Dee, an English scholar and mystic, that, quote, in the midst of the four countries, that is islands, is a whirlpool into which there empty the four indrawing seas which divide the north. And the water rushes round and descends into the earth, just as if one were pouring it through a filter funnel except that right under the pole there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea. Its circumference is almost 33 French miles, and it is all of magnetic stone. Mercator shows this geography very clearly, with the four islands separated by rivers and the large magnetic rock sitting on the pole itself, over the whirlpool where the waters descend into the interior of the globe. Other bits of information depicted by Mercator, also taken from the Inventio, include a legend that, quote, pygmies whose length is four feet live on the island above Scandinavia, and another legend on the island to the left stating it is, quote, the best and most salubrious in all the north. Obviously, this is mythical geography, though the Inventio Fortunati may have been based to some extent on first-hand reports by Ivor Bardardson, who was a priest from Greenland who traveled widely in the Eastern Canadian Arctic in the early 14th century. Whether the stories of the water passing through four rivers and then into a whirlpool was a confused misreading of Bardardson's reports or an illusionary creation of the Inventio's author cannot be known. The Mercator conception was followed by a number of other late 16th century cartographers such as on the world map by Abraham Ortelius from 1570, and in the world map by Petrus Plancius from 1594. However, this misconception did not hang around for long. The latter half of the 16th century was a time of considerable exploration in the waters north of Europe, for instance, by Hugh Willoughby in 1553 and William Barantz in the 1590s, and Mercator's polar geography of the four islands in the whirlpool began to lose favor, as shown in Barantz's own map of the polar region from 1598. This geographical myth subsequently did not last long, and it had disappeared from most maps by the fourth decade of the 17th century. In contrast, the next geographic myth we will look at is quite different, for not only did it last a fair bit longer, but it relates to the southern polar region, and ironically, this myth actually fairly closely matched reality. Since ancient times, there was a widely held belief that there had to be a large landmass in the southern hemisphere. Some Greek and Roman scholars 
believed that since all the known lands were north of the equator, there must be matching lands to the south. Part of this was a belief that God would have made the world symmetrical, but there was also a thought that if all the lands were in the north, the globe would tip over. There were a number of different theories of what the southern lands looked like, including the influential conception of Claudius Ptolemy, the second century astronomer and geographer. His Geographia included the notion that there was a large landmass connecting southern Africa with Asia, making the Indian Ocean an enclosed body of water. The world maps of his Geographia, which were first printed in 1477, showed this land bridge, and this helped to spread the notion of a southern continent. However, in 1488, Bartholomew Diaz rounded the southern tip of Africa, proving that the Indian Ocean was open to the Atlantic. This killed the Ptolemaic geography of the southern land, which mostly disappeared from printed maps by the early 16th century. However, the idea of a large body of land to the far south continued. Francesco Rosselli's 1508 world map was the first printed map to show a southern continent disconnected from the other known continents. Rosselli's geography was based purely on speculation, and it shows that this notion was still current among some geographers in the early 16th century. This continent was usually called Terra Australis, that is, southern land. Mapmakers often had preconceived ideas of what the unknown parts of the world were like, and they eagerly looked for confirmation of these beliefs in the reports of contemporary explorations. As it happened, there were soon a couple of discoveries which seemed to offer confirmation to the notion of a large southern continent. In 1520, Ferdinand Magellan sailed through a strait leading from the Atlantic Ocean to what Magellan called the Pacific Ocean. On his right, as he sailed through, was South America, and on his left was what today we know as the archipelago of Terra del Fuego. However, Magellan, carrying the notion of a great southern continent already in his head, assumed that the land on his left was that long theorized continent. The expedition, sadly without Magellan, who was killed in the Philippines in 1521, arrived back in Europe in 1522, reporting that they had sighted the coastline of the previously undiscovered southern continent. Because of this, Terra Australis is sometimes called Magellanica. Just a few years later, in 1526, Francisco de Hochas, one of the captains on a follow-up expedition to the East Indies, was blown off course by a gale before he could sail through Magellan Strait. He sighted land to the southeast of the strait, probably South Georgia Island. However, this discovery was reported back to Europe as another sighting of the great southern continent. These two discoveries were shown on a pair of hemispheric maps by Franciscus Monachus, published in 1527. Monachus showed a slightly squiggly line connecting the Magellan and the Dehochus discoveries, then drew a straight line around the circumference of the rest of the polar region, adding a legend which states, quote, this part of the coastline is not yet revealed to us. That is, we haven't found it yet, but the coastline of the southern continent must be somewhere in this area. In the text accompanying the maps, Monachus justified connecting the two discoveries with a continuous coastline with the comment that, quote, the rest of the Austral coast lies in obscurity, but to me it seems very likely that that part of the earth is not overspread and covered with ocean. In 1531, Orontius Phineas issued an unusual world map with a polar projection, which clearly depicts a prominent Terra Australis, which is noted as being, quote, recently discovered but not yet explored. By that, he certainly meant the discovery of Magellan, shown in the bottom right, but he also places Brasiliae Regiae along the continental coastline which lies south of India. This was a relocation to the imaginary southern continent of early discoveries in South America by Pedro Cabral and others. This transposition was the result of misreading the expedition's reports, combined with the pre-existing theoretical belief in a Terra Australis, 
and this mistake appeared on a number of other maps from the period. The rest of the coast seems to have been drawn somewhat at random to connect these points of discovery, and possibly to reflect a few other expeditions to the South Sea. However, it has been pointed out that the Phineas outline bears a surprising resemblance to the actual shape of the Antarctic continent. While some pseudo-scholars have argued that this is evidence of extraterrestrial information being passed on to Europeans in the early 16th century, it seems more likely that this is just, as one scholar called it, a fluke of whimsy. This world map by Abraham Ortelius, which we looked at earlier for its depiction of the Mercator Arctic myth, shows a very large Terra Australis Nondum Cognita, that is, southern land not yet known. This map nicely shows how geographers at the time were continuing to shape the outline of the southern continent as new, quote, discoveries were made. Ortelius connects Magellan's supposed discovery of the continent with Portuguese discoveries of New Guinea to the west, for it was thought that New Guinea might be part of the southern continent. The Portuguese had made a number of landings on New Guinea earlier in the century, but it wasn't until 1605 that Torres sailed through the strait named after him, which separates New Guinea and Australia. Looking to the east of Magellan's discovery, Ortelius shows a promontory which likely, likely reflects the Dehochus discovery of South Georgia Island, and then Piscatorum Regia, that is, Parrot Kingdom, another reference to the misplaced Cabral discoveries. Further east of this, just south of the East Indies, Ortelius shows another promontory with three names, Beach, Lukach, and Malator. These names and the location were based on a misreading of Marco Polo's account of his visit to China at the end of the 13th century. In the early 17th century, the first separate map of Terra Australis Incognita, that is, unknown southern land, was issued by Petrus Bertius. This makes it pretty clear that the shape of the continent was created by simply drawing an imagined coast between the known points of discovery, starting with Magellan Strait, the Dehochis discovery, the Cabral discoveries, the Marco Polo reference, and the New Guinea discoveries. It is important to note that despite the fact that there is a great southern continent, Antarctica, Terra Australis is a classic cartographic myth. It was a mythical creation based on the illusion that the world would tip over without the counterweight of a southern continent, as well as on confusions of various, quote, discoveries. The Magellan and Dehochis discoveries were for islands, not a continent. The Portuguese discoveries of the early 16th century were in South America, not on a southern continent. And the Polo information referred to places in Southeast Asia. There was no true factual basis for Terra Australis, which appeared on the maps from the 15th to the early 17th century. And this is something that Europeans were soon to begin to learn beginning the year that the Bertius map was published, 1616. Previously, some doubt had been raised about whether Terra del Fuego was part of Terra Australis, for in 1578, after passing through the Strait of Magellan, Francis Drake was blown far to the southeast of the strait, seemingly showing that there was open water below Terra del Fuego. A few maps show Terra del Fuego separate from any southern continent in the late 16th century, though Drake's discovery was mostly ignored. That is, until the explorations of William Shorten and Jacques Le Maire in 1616. They had set off from Europe to try to find a new way to the East Indies, and in the process discovered Cape Horn as they sailed south of Terra del Fuego thus proving it to be a series of islands and not part of Terra Australis. This discovery, of course, necessitated the changing of what had been the standard depiction of Terra de Fuego as part of the southern continent. William Blau had issued a world map in 1606 with that geography, but when he got word of the new discoveries, he quickly modified his map 
by erasing the coastline of Magellanica in that area, changing the depiction of Terra del Fuego to an archipelago. Subsequently, there were a whole series of explorations in the southern waters in the early 17th century, including Dutch discoveries around Australia. A number of expeditions were sent out specifically seeking the southern continent, but limited by ice and weather, the only land they found were islands, casting more doubt on the theoretical Terra Australis. This led cartographers to do more erasing of the continental coastline on their maps, leaving only remnants or vague indications of islands. This map by Henricus Hondius is a good example, with less than half of the supposed continent's coastline left over. By the late 17th century, while some mapmakers continue to show a vast Terra Australis, most cartographers, including John Sellers in 1672, got rid of any indication of land around the South Pole. The eradication of the myth of Terra Australis is definitively proclaimed by this map of the South Pole by French cartographer Guillaume de Lille. De Lille was one of the main proponents of what was called scientific cartography, in contrast to the earlier speculative cartography. One of the main tenets of this new approach was that nothing should be shown on a map unless there was hard first-hand evidence for its existence. Despite many explorations in the southern waters, there was no hard evidence of a southern continent. De Lille shows the roots of the explorations with their actual discoveries, but the only land he shows in the far south is an island that was reported to have been seen by Francis Drake in 1578. It is ironic that by following the best practices of cartographic theory, de Lille actually ends up with one of the graphic pictures of the South Pole, which is furthest from the truth. Belief in a possible Southern continent did persist, and the 18th and early 19th century saw more expeditions seeking its discoveries. The real continent was not sighted until 1820, and it wasn't until 1840 that Charles Wilkes established that there really was an extensive continent at the South Pole. It took many years thereafter to do a real mapping of Antarctica, which finally brought maps of the world back to looking something like they looked three centuries before, but this time based on real knowledge, not a cartographic myth. Thank you for watching this Philadelphia Print Shop West online lecture which we hope you found interesting and informative. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. If you would like to see a selection of original maps, including some with these cartographic myths, please visit our website at pps-west.com.